Hey everyone, I am so incredibly excited to introduce Hollywood film editors, Myron Kirsten, ACE, Andrew Weisblum, ACE, to Ask the Fonz. Myron has edited numerous of films and shows such as In the Heights, Crazy Rich Asians, and Girls. Andrew has edited films such as The French Dispatch, Mother, and Moonrise Kingdom. But today we'll be talking about their work on their most recent hit Netflix film, which they are both nominated for the Oscar this year and have also won the Eddie Award for the best edited feature film this year, Tick, Tick, Boom. Congratulations on your Eddie Award and thank you again so much for joining us today. We're all excited here to hear about your stories and experiences working on Tick, Tick, Boom. Um, before I do begin, uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to Rachel Aberley. Allison Decknatel and Margaret Gordon at Netflix, as well as Mar Marilyn Lintel and Ashley Abshire from Storyline PR for setting up this interview. So without further ado, let's begin. Um, I guess my very first question would be, you know, what are some of the challenges when editing a musical like this? You know, did you have to organize, you know, the prep work, the dailies in a different way other than the films that you've edited before? Um, is the, you know, I guess the prep work different or mostly the same? Can you give us some insight on like what's how it's like editing on a big movie like this? Um, well, there are certain organizational things that are different um, about the footage, particularly when you're dealing with playback um, and playback vocals versus live vocals. Generally speaking, you're always dealing with playback music. I mean, there are exceptions to that, but at least in this case, that's what it was. So there are certain organizational principles to that, which are not particularly complicated and not a big part of what we do. I mean, except that um, you have a, a frame of reference to keep things in sync. <laughs> um, yeah. But apart from that, um, you know, the challenges of cutting a musical are not radically different than um, a regular feature film in that you still have to target a certain digestible length and pace and storytelling and character. All those things still come into play and they're not different just because someone's singing. Um, I mean, the musical numbers still have to carry story or character or push the film forward in some way. They're not, as long as they're not pausing the piece for just a performance interruption in the middle of your story. I think that's, that's ultimately the goal and the challenge. There are other challenges to it that have to do with um, pacing and being able to manipulate it when you're dealing with a, a regular narrative feature things are a little bit more flexible and modular in terms of um, how you can condense and combine scenes and tell your story. But once you hit a song in a musical, you have to get from the beginning to the end of it in some structurally logical way. You can condense those songs or simplify those songs or, or cross cut them with dialogue as we do in a lot of places. Um, but still the song is the song that has to have some reasonable shape. So um, those, I think, are the are the uniquenesses or challenges. Myron, did I miss anything there, or is that kind of <clears throat> all of it? Yeah, that's a lot of it. Um, you know, just from a more geeky standpoint, um, we, you know, we'll literally, you know, organize it. You know, uh, multicam. Uh, if there's like, you know, there could be anywhere from three to six cameras running on re really big numbers. Uh, that was more the case for in the Heights. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, we'd build these super groups where you can have all the all of the um, <clears throat> all the different setups and takes there just if you wanted it. Um, and then I also have the assistance um, script sync, um, literally the lyrics like like dialogue, because I like to treat the, you know, the lyrics just like dialogue that I'm choosing performance. Of course, if it's live, you know, that could be a whole other thing where, you know, you're literally crafting the performance live and then, you know, you know, stealing from other places, uh, other sound takes, uh, off camera stuff, you know, anything like any other film that you would do. But um, uh, otherwise, it's pretty it's pretty um, much what you would expect when you're approaching almost any other scene um, with these really gigantic numbers on in the heights. Um, I would have to break things down into mini scenes. And I think, and you've probably done this uh, with like action stuff, or sometimes you just have to break them down into like smaller units just mm -hmm. to be able to tackle them. And, um, you know, <clears throat> Andy, for example, I've made a pass at Y and it was in really great shape, but I was like, well, there's so much footage to Y, I guess I'll just 
watch it down in sections again uh just to see if there was anything else because you know it's it's a very long song it's you know and there's there was a lot of coverage so um just trying to make sure you don't get lost in the footage do you ever because there is a bunch of in tick tick boom there's a bunch of like oneers that like follow the character into like different rooms can you manipulate that like it, 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 in vfx can vfx do anything to that or are you kind of locked into those those oneers they're all they're almost always tricks i mean yeah. whether it's whether it's speed ramps or splits or finding ways to merge takes in, in a hidden cut that maybe isn't planned or um, sometimes you can morph one side and then another side in a split depending on what the shot's doing to transition to another take um, there are all sorts of gags like that that you can do um, you know there are obvious limitations but um, effects guys like to say anything's possible until, <laughs> yeah. you, until you ask for it <clears throat> Yeah, I just wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to bring that up because you know a lot of you know sometimes we never we we will never know what what is actually a considered a oneer or if it's actually all you know locked in. So there's there's literally takes in in the heights where like people are crossing each other in the background, like it, just impossible shots that you think. But you're like, I really like these two different takes for different reasons. And so if you have a great VFX team and um, and the budget, of course. Um, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do, to be honest. Yeah. With you. Can you share if were there any of those uh oneers that you manipulated in Tick Tick Boom or were they all kind of like that in the dailies? There are tons of manipulations all over the place. I don't know that, you know, certainly splits and things and oneers, but I, I don't know that there's Martin, I can't think right away of any super heavy manipulation like that where we were combining takes on that weren't intended for that in a oneer. But there are definitely shots where, you know, you're either in overs or splits or two shots or masters where you're combining or collapsing action in a pretty complicated way. Um, <clears throat> that happens all the time. I mean, basically. if you want to take something, uh, you know, this concept, this idea, you know, Sunday is pretty much all a visual effect. I mean, none of those, right. none of those actors or a majority of those actors were not in the same space together. So there was so that whole number because of COVID, you know, was shot in different sections and then tiled together. So yeah. um wow. Almost every setup there was like four or five tiles at least. I'll um, have to rewatch that and because look. nobody That's nobody's awesome. together and those were like motion control moves or sometimes locked offs, but it depended on where it was in the song. Um yeah, that's obviously heavy manipulation. And then when, so you were just saying that since they were all shot separately, how, how did you like put that together and pre-visualize that for making it all come together? Did you have a VFX editor team or uh, had your assistants do that? Yeah, well, we had our assistants and I had, a, we had a great visual effects editor, Dave Smith, who would who lined up the stuff for me in the assembly. Um, just depending on, we'd have one or two takes in each set, each one of those setups for each of the people on the frame. So we would basically just have to pick what we want. Sometimes we would slip the action and things internally or whatever, depending on whether you wanted to someone to react differently or not. But obviously you're stuck with the lyric lip sync. So there's only so much um, adjustment you're gonna do um, that you can really get away with. Um, although thankfully that was the, the dialogue was not, um, the, the lyrics were not, too percussive so you could slide things around pretty easily without feeling a sync issue when you're dealing with a chorus of people singing cool. um yeah um i do want to talk about uh you know most as we are talking about the musical numbers here and sort of what was your process in attacking sort of these pretty intricate scenes you know how did you find that balance of cutting to like exposition in the story and then cutting back to the monologue or the musical number you know how much did you work through these scenes and 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 sort of give us insight on like sometimes did you feel there was too much story or there's too much musical or like how did you uh sort of balance that you know working on a musical is no different from <laughs> any other film where you're just balancing the drama and the action and the plot um you know we literally cut out a musical number out of tick tick boom which may see the light of day soon I, I hear a rumor of that, um, but 
um, you know, uh, we're, ta- you know, we're, we're trying to be fearless in like, you know, trying to play around with the balance of everything. Um, and all that just is with experimentation and, you know, that cutting back and forth between monologue and stage performance and story, it was all found in the edit. You know, none of that was scripted. None of that was storyboarded or st- uh, pre-visualized. You know, everything is us, Andy and I playing until they say pencils down um, with how <clears throat> how the uh, intercutting and how we're interweaving everything. I mean, just like just like any movie, you know, when you take your time with the assembly and you you have this version that's comprehensive, there are certain numbers and certain things that go through hundreds of rounds of minutia changes and then some that just kind of stay the way they were because they ultimately serve they don't present themselves as an issue in the pace of the thing or the overall piece and you know you don't if it ain't broke <laughs> you leave it be um in service of of other things that have more you know there's some numbers there that changed very little along the way um you know um i think Johnny can't decide went through so a specific change that had to do a reshoot, but structurally it's kind of remained the same throughout. It just had to do with Susan's character and, and de-emphasizing or re-emphasizing something in terms of her cutaways. Um, but then, then there were other numbers that changed constantly like 3090, because ultimately that's about exposition and setting up the film and tone and all these other things in it. Um, that you just keep honing till the end. Um, that in itself is not particularly different. I mean, there are other things that introduce themselves along the way and that we're working with um, a playback pre-record of the music that's going to evolve into something much more sophisticated by the time the final mix is done. And that kind of influences everything else in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't really get into that until later. Um, unless you can see that there's something about it that's going to really influence the pace and the cut. An example would be, um, a spoiler alert, once, once John learns that um, Michael is HIV positive and we take ourselves from that moment in the office all the way to singing through singing Why, which is a big evolution for the character, um, both real life, the singing and intercut with the monologue that Jonathan is having about his friendship into the song Why are both two fairly long pieces. Um, the, the Why was something like six minutes at some point and, and the section leading up to it is almost as long. And I recognized almost immediately that um, it, was more, it was more drawn out then we could probably get away with. And, and real life had to actually lead into why instead of being its own piece in a way. Um, but the challenge was they're both the solo vocal pieces with just piano. And, and there was something about that that made it feel even longer and, and, and um, more protracted in a way. Um, so we completely changed it was a discussion Lynn and I had early on we changed the instrumentation of real life from just piano to a more of a rock ballad kind of in the that kind of expressed the frustration and rage that these these characters were going through in that moment um, which seemed to work emotionally and it also contrasted between that and then stripped down to the solo piano of why that it felt more like a progression to do it that way but that's something we start to bring in new instrumentation early because it kind of influences your sense of pace. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I know. I love hearing sort of just that process because it, you know, again, we don't ever, we just see it in its final form and you're like, Oh, wow. You experimented the whole time where you played. I mean, not of course, you know, that <clears throat> there's a, there's a, a framework that you have to follow a script or, you know, direction, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, it's both of you guys playing and, enjoying the process of creating something. you know and what's also interesting there is you know so andy built this you know s- sonic <laughs> explosion with lynn and alex um Lackamore and bill sherman and you know that then influences other decisions 
for example, um, there was stuff in, there was longer monologue at one point in that section and I had stripped it down. And then um, Lynn was like, well, there's something missing. And then we found some older monologue that hadn't been in maybe since Andy's assembly. And so I had rediscovered things, but influenced by like the vibe that he had created. So it, it, one thing affects the other and you don't really always know when you get there how you got there but suddenly you're like there's you know there's something else that you know um we need here to to make this feel complete and, uh, it's just an ongoing ripple effect same yeah. with like the archival footage the way that we started to use that one way and you know which i think by the time it got to what it became at the end of the film which feels very um integral and logical as a structural thing um had a pretty circuitous path you know it wasn't it wasn't from script or even from shooting it wasn't obvious that we were going to use it in the way that we used it it was always there kind of as a peripheral piece but not as not as integral as it became oh interesting i, I mean i love that like when you kind of have no stone unturned and you kind of try everything and then that sort of path or those paths or webs of ideas inform or influence what is in the actual cut and i think that's sort of so the satisfying part about editing is you coming to a conclusion through different ideas yeah great um my next question is how was working with uh director lynn manuel miranda you know how did he influence your approach on editing because you know this to me it felt like such a beautiful dance you know everything was so well edited and hit the right mark and i was just like how how did this all come together with you know his direction and just with his experience in theater and um just it felt everything just felt like a dance um well i was just curious how was your process like working with him well i mean he's not like any first time director i've encountered before because he has um the writing chops and the acting chops and theater chops as a creator um of a of an entire piece so he kind of he's obviously intimately familiar with all the steps that's associated with that so um he would recognize a lot about our editorial process that related for him to what he would do in the theater whether it's workshopping a show and rewriting it and rewriting it and rewriting it based on what his collaborators are bringing to the table and what's working in the context of shaping an evening, as he would put it, which is not dissimilar to shaping the pace of the film. And then there's the 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 test screenings being effectively previews, mm -hmm. like theatrical previews, and and feeling from an audience without it necessarily being articulated in a document what it is they're responding to or not responding to, and where things are waning or losing track. Um, he was very conscious of all that stuff. But he was also um, open to collaborative ideas and experimentation and not overly precious about anything specifically, whether it was working or not working. Um, it was just a good um, dialogue that brought us a lot of new ideas. And you know, we were we were lucky to be able to work with him in person, even though there was the pandemic, but we mm -hmm. we basically potted together and lived together and um, you know, that that was essential because um, there's only there's so many things that come out of being in a room with someone and just watching something and experiencing it together and having a vibe together about um, what you're seeing and feeling and, and having ideas that sometimes don't need a lot of explanation when you're sitting in a room together versus a Zoom or an email or whatever yeah. other process that that, you know, it's. I've, I have been working with other people in the remote way and it doesn't really compare. I mean, you have to collaborate in person, I think. And thankfully we were able to. And thankfully he was very down to earth and a mensch as a person. So, you know, uh, at first I was incredibly intimidated to work with Lynn, even though I had uh, a handful of interactions with him on In the Heights, I didn't really know him that well. And, obviously didn't know him as a director. And so it was a, a big relief to be able to sit down with him and just discuss um, ideas like you would with any other director. And then at the same time, um, 
being really inspired because he's looking to you for answers and, um, you know, looking to you to say, you know, how do we raise the bar? And you're like, well, you made Hamilton. <laughs> um, and um, so that's, you know, that's a real, that's very flattering to be, yeah. to be able to get that nod from somebody who's, you know, arguably the Shakespeare of our times saying, you know, what can we hey, do? Th yeah, what can we do now? <laughs> um, um, but I, uh, it, it was definitely unlike any experience I've had with a director, you know, being, you know, integrated into his life and then be a part you know, of something so special. Nice. Yeah, that's really great to hear. Um, so I'd actually love to hear about, I've, you've mentioned a little bit about it um, in the call, but I'd love to hear about sort of the collaboration you both had when editing this film. You know, how did you guys split up the work? Who served it what? Or was it sort of both of you taking all at everything all at once uh, at spontaneous times and kind of just editing it all together what was like the collaboration for 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 you both well the film originally started we started shooting at the beginning of um uh 2020 and then the pandemic shut us down and then we resumed in october or so um but the process went on for about a year at which point i was i came up against some previous obligations on another film. So um, I had to leave at a certain point, but Myron took over for me around the, the end of the director's cut going into previews. Um, so we had a bit of an overlap and um, had a lot of, he, uh, Myron's one of the first people apart from our executives and producers to see the film. Mm -hmm. um, but the, my goal was to kind of overlap with him as much as possible to help him through the transition and then try to keep my distance so that he, you know, I mean, one of the things that's important in that process is that there's an, you know, there's an editor in charge basically, and that it needed to, if it wasn't going to be me, me, it needed to be Myron and that he needed to own that process, um, which, you know, um, it's probably daunting in retrospect that because there's a lot to learn but thankfully had a little quarantine period to catch up right mm -hmm. and um you know i tried not to drown him in information just kind of the the general topics that lynn and i had talked about with the film that we knew um we had to calibrate once we showed it to an audience and of course Myron was a perfect fit because he knew a lot of the collaborators on the film from in the heights and um and, uh, you know, besides all his other good work and that he um, had his own ideas as well, which is really the, the thing you want. Yeah, I had to take it in baby steps at first because not only was I getting to know the film, like I said before, I was getting to know Lynn and I had, to, I couldn't, you know, I had very strong ideas about like, this scene doesn't work, this relationship is a problem, this character arc needs to go this direction. But you can't always go in with a sledgehammer and just start, you know, and it's also very dangerous. You can get lost in the film if you go too fast, too quick. But I, I wanted to get more data from screening for other audiences and making sure that my my concerns matched, um, uh, you know, the film's concerns and the audience's concerns. And, uh, you know, also Lynn and Andy had, you know, had some notions as well before I even started. Um, and then I, it was just up to me to just keep pushing because I knew the stakes were high. This is Lynn's first movie. Yeah. People know people who know Jonathan Larson. They're like they're on it. They're like they expect a certain degree of of um, uh, I don't know truth or or just you know uh, they want to be they want everything. <laughs> right. They want it to be right. And um, so I I had to, once I was a little bit more confident over the weeks and months i could be more aggressive and say hey i think we need to cut out this number i think we should like revisit you know um you know the opening and ending of the film you know this number could use some additional photography um so you go from this like okay i'll just you know dabble a little bit to um you know having your hands you know all over the film and then of course trying to be a leader for your crew who doesn't know you at first and then get to know them and, and be a very appreciative to this crew that's been on from the get go, but then get really, you know, embedded with, you know, your music editors, your VFX department, you know, just have a lot of 
balls in the air that yeah. you have to like suddenly catch and do something with it. You mentioned like leaving things out on the cutting floor and cutting scenes and, you know, having to make those difficult decisions. You know, how do you, I guess, how do you decide when something has to get cut out of the, 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 the cut, you know, especially if you and the director feel very strongly about it, like, you know, what is that conversation like? Um, and that process of, of truly just deciding to leave something out of the film. There are a lot of reasons that can go into that. I mean, you know, some of them are just about the overall, some of it's just about the overall pace and things that um, end up being redundant and repetitive rather than amplifying something. Um, that's usually the first stuff that finds its way out because it's not so controversial. It's not even, it's not even excising an idea per se. It's just simplifying and streamlining, which is kind of the thing that starts to happen right away in the best case scenario. But um, I think more often than not, and certainly the case here is that you're, you're aware of certain things that you're dancing around, like um, what does this movie mean for people who know who Jonathan Larson was and what Rent was versus people who don't? And how do we make it work for both at the same time? Um, what are some tone questions and time and place questions that we wanna make sure people understand without it getting kind of boring and obvious for people who are familiar with it? Um, what are some pace issues in the first half of the film to get to the meat of the story and the character and 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 get things going in a way that um, you know maybe reads faster than it plays. Um, all those things kind of come into play, and I, I'm rarely concerned about being ruthless and cutting something out because it's you can always put it back in. It's always it's always worth experimenting and juxtaposing and combining and collapsing ideas. Um, you know, so that process is not it's not it's not end all usually when you approach it, or at least that's my attitude about it, is that it, like, it, doesn't, it doesn't usually mean this is gonna be the definitive way we do it. And that um, almost always I'm working with multiple versions of things and multiple paths and ideas dancing around the issues that we're discussing. Um, and you know, usually if something is to be removed, the argument kind of makes itself. You know, an, an example was, this number that had been cut out, which I mean, I think has been talked about enough, which is being dress, is that um, there was an early conversation with um, Lynn when we were watching it, where he said, if I had been writing this musical originally, I would never have put no more and green, green dress back to back because it feels like too much of the same tone for too long. And I, I made a mental note in the back of my head, one of those is gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere along the way because you can't ignore that instinct like there's something there's something there you can't correct that by shortening one or shortening the other that's not going to work so we had to you know i never said that to myron but myron picked up on that radar pretty quickly when you look at things structurally and start to understand it and get analytical with it you know the other thing that happens automatically is you start to sh as you start to share it with more people and show things to not just audiences, but other collaborators and friends, you start to notice the consistency in comments, what the issues are in the film, what is the taste barometer that people are gonna have about like, in this film, the character's anxiety and neuroses and what level or, or is an audience willing to accept for that without it getting overbearing um, and that less is more potentially. Uh, but you don't actually know the answer to those questions until you start to show it to people. And then you, if you start to hear the same basic ideas or people without being prompted and starting to talk about the same things, you know that something has to change or leave to address that. Yeah, you, you have to be fearless when you're experimenting on a with a film. You can't be afraid to try ideas. And, um, and sometimes, um, also your director, yeah, you have to be, um, you have to be at a place with your director where they could be fearless as well. And sometimes that, that takes, that could be take time with certain directors. Sometimes you never get there. Mm -hmm. um, but um, to be able to experiment is, and um, try things is the only way you ever make anything good. And, um, 
And sometimes when you lift a scene or lift like a, a section of a scene, um, the transitions can be all off. And then I think that's like your producers or, you know, outside forces, they'll be like, there's something wrong here. This doesn't work. You're like, no, wait a minute. I just haven't figured out how to finesse this yet. It doesn't mean that the idea is bad. It's just that I haven't figured out, you know, uh, figuring out the glue yet. And, um, and, you know, that could that could take as much time as like, you know, the idea itself, you know, trying to make it all, uh, you know, work. But, um, you know, to, you have to keep at it and not be afraid. And and if there's an itch, you need to scratch it. And um, and, you know, Andy was refer referring to like you, you hear the note behind the note. We've talked a lot about that lately as far as like you you get someone tells you that there's something wrong here but they don't they can't tell you why and you or they might be very specific about a note and but you're like well it's not that there, there's something else behind it so um anyways uh, you, you have to you have to be fearless you have to be fearless too the one thing to be careful about is that sometimes people will zero in on some issue or some scene or some moment not working and just as often as not, it's not actually that moment that's the problem. It's whatever setup that takes you to that moment is somehow not clicked into place. And the note behind the note idea is trying to figure out, okay, people don't like this scene. Why? If it's Is it bad? Or is there something, is it not, why is it not working for people? Why have we not arrived at that point that they're going with us on that journey? And is it essential to us? in us in order for us to fix it and if so what you know where did we go astray before we realized it um more often than not it has to do with something that's come before the moment that people are targeting them than the actual moment like they they've lost their way in the movie and only realize it when they hit x but they <laughs> they lost it somewhere in s or t you know yeah that's sort of of oh go ahead go ahead I was just going to say that a lot of people will ping like the, you know, the the first half of a movie or something that they're not engaged and it's like, well, should I be cutting out all these scenes or should I be like, you know, what what is it, what is it about this beginning that isn't working and you're just constantly analyzing everything. And so sometimes you're taking scenes out, sometimes you take out sections of the scenes, sometimes you're like, okay, we need to reshoot or rewrite or, you know, throw everything at it. Um, so um, just being able, again, to experiment, to be aggressive, um, you know, to not be fearless. Um, I mean, to, to be fearless and, um, and um, you know, hopefully, um, hopefully your collaborators will join you in that, you know, that searching. A, a lot of times in notes, when you get, particularly from a studio, there's this thing that happens, which I refer to as edge shaving, where basically whatever the, the pointiest part of the sculpture, the biggest, the boldest things that are sticking out that, that don't fall immediately into expectations is the thing that gets targeted. And you have to be a little wary of that, that that is not, it's just easy to flag the thing because it sticks out in memory, not because it's actually the issue. That's really interesting. Do you, do you feel like, I guess, like that pointy part of that sculpture is usually sometimes the most beloved part of your edit or like what, that sometimes that's the point yeah sometimes it's the it's the thing you're trying to build to yeah. and you haven't gotten there successfully so you have to figure out why that is that's the job unless you know if you can sit there and say but this is what the movie's about this is what the essence is i'm sorry if it bothers you but this is this is what we're trying to do you can't just throw out the dna of a piece or else you just you know delivering a widget you have to you have to actually make an impression on someone and that's what those moments do so you have to figure out how to arrive at them in a way that um couches that problem however you can yeah i, I mean it's it's what you're what you're both saying is great like i love what you told what you said about sort of nothing is ever really deleted off the film or nothing's ever mm -hmm. feud like set in stone and i think that also for i guess the first time editors including myself like that sort of lets off the pressure a little bit when making decisions and cutting and playing around and you know trying new things that aren't scripted and and playing with the director's notes and sort of giving your own take or perception of how the edit is um and then also kind of just making sure you have the audience i guess not at the edge of their seat but 
thinking as one step ahead of them and and building up to this you know x to y situation right or at a minimum at minimum being in sync with them you want to be ahead of them you don't you don't want to be behind them <laughs> right it's the right. last place you want to be but sometimes it's a little of both yeah um when uh editing a biopic of someone like this um did you feel like you had a responsibility to tell the story right i know you had mentioned a little bit of it myron but you know how much prep work did you had to do on jonathan larson um and sort of his work um what was like the research like for for this film well, I didn't really do any research. Um, I knew and I knew a bunch about him and and about rent. And I felt like the things I didn't know that were important, I wanted the film to tell me. And if I had any questions to, you know, it wasn't a this isn't a historical document. You know, it's a tribute to this to this guy. And there are certain fictional licenses taken with it that make the story universal to a struggling artist and and you know what the challenges are that you face as an artist trying to balance your work and your art and your life and all those things that was really the focus not i mean the movie's ripe with easter eggs having to do with the time and the place and that and theater world of course but um ultimately i didn't think that's what would be the most interesting thing about the movie um so there were certain kind of historical context things that I thought were useful to bring into the movie that I, you know, whether it's the Helm stuff or other things like that, that I thought were um, valuable for people to understand and relate to about what the challenges were for these characters in that time. Um, I wanted to make sure people understood that stuff. But in terms of Jonathan specifically and his legacy, um, I think those things became self-evident in the storytelling and in the character um, that I didn't have to. But Myron, I think, had a different experience. I mean, Myron, you knew you knew less about Jonathan when you joined in. Yeah, it was literally Lynn um, and my first call with him uh, giving me the whole history lesson, the crash course of Jonathan Larson and, and, um, and really about Lynn's own story about how Jonathan influenced him. And um, of course, Right away, I was like, oh, well, it's going to be all in regardless, but I was like, I'm all in on this idea of like how he's influenced so many people in it and, and how Rent made such a difference in musical theater and there wouldn't be necessarily in the Heights or Hamilton without Rent. And um, there was a part of me that felt like the knowledge of hearing that he had passed away before uh, Rent saw its day on Broadway um, was really intriguing to me. And I remember um, researching, uh, looking up uh, the obituary for Jonathan Larson. And there was something about me, that knowledge that made watching the film very emotional for me. So that kept uh, hanging over me a little bit and wondering if that there was a there was a need for the audience to have that information as well. But at the same time, Lynn made it very clear that this wasn't about Jonathan Larson's death. It was about his legacy and about his life's work. And um, so I had to reconcile how to, <laughs> how to do that over the course of almost the entire time I was on the film. Like, how do I just give people enough information in order to uh, have some kind of uh, context, I guess? Mm -hmm. um, but um, other than that, I, you know, I'd, I had a crash course, not only in Jonathan Larson, but musical, uh, musical uh, theater history. And, um, uh, you know, being with Lynn, it's, you're all in. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the professor for sure, you know, tell, you know, just rattling off names. You're like, wait, what? Oh, let me, let me get my pad of paper down. Um, but um you know, in a lot of ways, I think it's just about an, like any artist who's finding their way. So um, it doesn't matter if you know Jonathan Larson or not, you, you have to connect to the this idea of like finding your way through your late 20s or just finding your way as an artist or or regardless, just finding your way as a human being. Um, and, um, you know, that was key. That was key to be able to engage whomever watches this film, whether they had knowledge of rent or otherwise, that they, they uh, connect to the journey. 
Yeah, I mean, I loved when I was watching it. I am also sort of like, I have like a base knowledge of like the musical theater industry and like who did what and stuff. But as the final sort of 15, 20 minutes of the movie wraps up, you're like, oh my God, like this whole thing is, you know, that play. And then it reveals that, you know, he did Rent and he unfortunately passed away like literally like the day before the, the screening or the, the preview. So you kind of, you do feel that, that, from the movie and I immediately sort of you know right after the movie did a, not went on Google and looked up you know it's like it, it did force you to kind of want to learn more about him because that's what you're right. saying like his legacy it does, yeah it doesn't end with the movie like it, it right. the nice thing about it is that it keeps you interested in this idea right. and that you want to learn more about it I mean there's something so profound about the idea that like he just missed experiencing the fact yeah. that he was a success and that he made a mark on the world yet he was a success and he made a mark on the world it doesn't change that fact right um it's right. just not something that he experienced and the question is you know what did that mean to him and the people he touched and 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 what does it mean about you know pursuing this stuff and running out of time and the sad irony of the fact that you know he he wrote a musical about his friends running out of time and that it, not just tick tick boom, but also rent. Right. And that ultimately he was the one with no time left. Is so, just yeah. It's just is it, it's you know there's so many things you could think about th that in terms of fate and legacy and all those things that are really deep. But mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, those things are not his story because he wasn't around for any of that. He was he, he was there before that happened. Yeah. Um, and that still needed to be interesting on its own. Yeah. We, we tried to um, educate the audience, but also Lynn just did not want to fall into those biopic tropes where you would have white you know, text and have a black screen saying, this is what happened to Jonathan Larson and his film would, you know, his, um, his, you know, uh, Broadway hit would uh, go on, you know, for this amount of years and you know we do it with voiceover but we were just trying to find an elegant way that didn't feel like every biopic that you had ever seen and um so just trying to find you know our uh, vocabulary to tell that information educate the audience but then say well tick tick boom is about all the stuff in between <laughs> as well and um you know that, that just that took a lot of experimentation as well just trying to um educate the audience the same way that we might come to it for the first time. Cool. Um, here's my question to switch into the personal editing career question. You ready for this? What was very interesting about the film was that you managed to capture the theme of relatability in the creative process. You know, the highs and lows of being an artist in any creative field are so accurately portrayed here. Was there ever a time in your careers where you felt like things weren't going your way, but you managed to trudge through the lows and now feel that you were happy and content of how everything panned out. Are you kidding? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to put that out there and make sure to, to ask that question. Cause I know a lot of us always go through really, you know, difficult times breaking into the industry and, and yeah, of course, doubt and frustration and convincing people that you're up to the task and all the, all the things that that implies and, and, you know, hard work and luck and opportunity and all the, all of that, you know, eventually aligning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, there's nothing but struggle. I mean, at first, right. Um, and eventually if you're lucky, I, you know, I worked as an assistant uh, in New York for over a decade, um, bouncing between you know, assisting as a film assistant and a visual effects editor and a regular assistant on um, all different size features in like the indie world and in, in New York. Um, and then in bigger budget studio films and just kind of learning how to do it and how not to do it. Um, and then um, also editing movies that, you know, just wanted to go to Sundance ultimately that most of them wouldn't. Um, and trying to find the right way out um you know i guess there's a story there and a strategy there that happened for me that worked that i was just um 
persistent about, but there's no real uh, singular path forward for that stuff. Um, and I was lucky enough to work with and meet people in a bunch of different capacities and one thing led to another. And I was an editor eventually. Um, the people had that confidence in me. Um, and I was mentored by people along the way who were gracious. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't just happen like a lightning strike for most people, including Jonathan. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, collectively between the two of us, you know, we have over 40 years of experience of uh, highs and lows. And um, I, there, I, there's just too many to recall as far as like just getting kicked down and like picking myself back up and having to do it again. You know, um, I've been fired. I've quit. I've, you know, I've... Um, Literally, um, I'll name one example. I was working on this film called Going in Style with Zach Braff, who had, had already done two movies with him. And I was working on that film and I was literally cutting dailies one day and I was just sitting there and I just had a panic attack and I just thought, there's no way I can do this movie. There's no way I can finish this film. I feel like I shouldn't be here. I'm an imposter. This is after already a decade of easily cutting things, a lot of things. And, you know, TV shows, you know, big films, small films. And it was all in my head. You know, I had literally had to snap myself out of it and um, and pick myself back up and just say, I can do this, I got this. And a whole process of me working evolved from that about like not getting overwhelmed, just trying to realize that certain days um, I was better than other days, you know, and, um, like certain days, if I had game, you know, I was like shooting three points every day. And then the other day, it's like, I can't cut something if I tried. I just, my rhythm's off, you know? So I just, you understand that it's just a grind. It's hard. It's hard work. And um, and there's certain projects that you're, you're it's going to come really easily to you. And some projects you cannot figure out how to make it better. And, um, and, um, I relate to this film so much, <laughs> the process and, you know, and the fact that we, you know, we've made some great things, you know, on our own and now uh, together um, is just, um, it's just, uh, it's just really what the artist process is about, you know? It's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just like when I sort of keyed that out of the film, when I was watching it as a sort of a big picture uh, bird's eye view standpoint, you're like, wow, this, kind of relates to editing as well like the going from like being a post PA to an assistant and people trusting you and obviously making that jump into editing is yeah it and all... demands on your life and your time and all that stuff to yeah <laughs> I've been there yeah. we all have you know um and those are the choices you make yeah yeah Let's talk about assistant editors real quick I know we're we're hitting towards the end here but I, I would love to sort of give some advice to the the majority of my uh, audience are assistants and people who are wanting to make the jump into editing and post PAs and you know college graduates and so uh, I'd love to hear sort of what um what do you look for in assistants you know especially on a movie like this you know how do you uh get your assistants creatively involved and sort of what do you what what kind of advice do you have for assistants who um, also want to make the jump into editing well in terms of what I, you know, having been an assistant myself for a long time, both in in film and then when things went digitally and then, you know, visual effects, all that stuff that kind of went through that whole spectrum. I mean, what I look for in assistants is assistants who are, um, who care about the, the film itself and the story being told and have a point of view of it and also are able to anticipate, anticipate creatively, also organizationally, politically, what's gonna be needed for us to just have the air clear to do what we need to do creatively to work on the film. Um, and they are collaborators. I mean, Kat, our first assistant on this film, I gave her many things to assemble for me in the beginning and offered it up to other assistants on the film, Morgan and other people who were working with us because I wanted them to feel invested in the process. 
um, it's important to me. Whether I use any of it or not is almost immaterial. There's, uh, there's nothing to lose, but at least they understand what the film is and start to think about it and the challenges that we're facing. And it's not just making sure I have the files and it's in sync and, you know, whatever other, the technical stuff, which is all obviously important and part of their purview. But I always look to my first assistant to really run the cutting room and make sure that um, things are delegated correctly. And I believe in delegating a lot um, so that people feel involved and they don't feel ostracized from this process. I mean, there are much easier ways to go out and make money if you want to. So you want people to feel invested in what, what they're doing and feel part of the creative process because they are, they're, they're the first witness of this, of this stuff. I always, I always solicit, my, you know, when we're working in person, I'm always showing scenes to my assistants before I show it to anyone else, even because, even if they have nothing to say, because it just, um, when you watch a scene that you cut with someone else, you automatically feel whether something's working or not working, or they seem confused, or you can feel it. And, and that's always helpful to me. And I always ask them questions, and often the assistants will worry about whether they're giving the right or wrong answer or right or wrong reaction to something. And I always encourage them, there is no wrong reaction. You're, I don't think you're not perceptive or not smart because you didn't realize something. That's my mistake that you didn't realize something. It's my job to deliver. So I want to know when something's not working. Um, in terms of what to suggest for assistants who want to be editors, this is a really difficult question because I think, uh, for me at least, the landscape has really changed from when I was coming up as an assistant where there was a very clear path that required a lot of technical know-how as an assistant for a relatively long period of time to get to this place where you can exercise the craft. I still think that's true, but it's much easier to dupe your way into position as an, as an editor um, without a wealth of experience and technical know-how and craft, I think that that underserves you and I think it underserves the process if you don't spend your time developing your chops and learning and trying and cutting anything you can. I think that that's, that's and failing at some of that stuff. Like you have to, you have to try to make things work and figure it out. Um, I know that because there's so much work around, there's a lot of opportunities, more opportunities to cut different things. Um, but you have to, I feel you have to, if you have the opportunity to be thoughtful and specific about the kind of work you do and the kind of stuff you put out there, if you want to make an impression as an editor and become um, desirable <laughs> as, a, as, as somebody to collaborate with on films, just because you can cut doesn't mean it's always going to be the right choice. Sometimes I took assistant jobs over low budget, um, very low budget indie films that I could have cut, where I learned tons more on, on in the assistant job. I was the first assistant on Chicago when I could have cut three indie films at the same time. And I can guarantee you, I benefited more from that process on Chicago than I did from any of those three films that never saw the light of day. And I think that that, um, it's important to be really specific about that and be specific about the kind of work you want to do and the people you want to collaborate with because um, it makes or breaks and you only get so many opportunities like that. Um, there's so much content out there and so much noise out there. You have to look for projects that are going to make an impact. So just cutting for cutting sake, especially when you're not ready, is um, something I would discourage. Well said. Um, you know, I, I I fear that there's going to be a whole generation of editors that are coming up that have no idea really how to cut anything, but they get the opportunity to cut and they think that that's editing. And I just see a lot of sloppy work out there already. And I think that is just because they've skipped the, you know, the learning process. They've gone either straight from film school to cutting on a show, assisting on two seasons on a show and then um you know they get their break um 
or they never even do that. They just they PA for two seconds and then they start cutting. I don't think I think that you should be cutting and assisting at the same time. I don't get me wrong. I think you should be learning to do both. Mm-hmm. But what somebody like Andrew and I can teach you is the politics and the craft and um, the uh, the showing them the process as far as like how you get from one place to another over the, over the course of working on something for a year. Um, we're really talking about, you know, um, you know, trying to be the best, like, <laughs> you know, I don't want to just be an editor. I want to be the best editor ever. And that comes I don't want the movie to be the best movie it can be. Yeah. Not, and, yeah, exactly. but that takes, that takes experience in, in, and, um, yeah, just a lot of patience. And I think that if you have a chance to cool your jets for a second and try to um, mentor under somebody, I would recommend that. What I'm also looking for somebody who's kind and who's hungry and um, who's a go-getter, who, who doesn't um, uh, expect certain things because they've done X, Y, and Z, that they're, they have gratitude for being there. Um, I find there's a lot of assistants that just expect certain things, whereas Andy and I um, really, you know, we literally had to work with editors who like, they wanted their pencil sharp in a certain way. And now we have assistant editors who's like, well, I don't want to get you coffee. And it, it's not about getting coffee. It's literally about like, well, you're at service to everybody in this film for whatever they need at any given point. You're and, getting me coffee, so I don't have to think about getting the coffee so that I can focus <laughs> on X. And that sounds ridiculous, but it's actually part of the thing. It's part of like hierarchy has a purpose in, in, in most of these spaces because we need to focus on what we're doing and everybody around us makes that possible, right? I mean, that's the way I see it. Yeah, on this show, I, this is my first time having an actual assistant as well. And I, I can, I've now realized like what you're saying, like just to, 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 to have someone else just do the thing that doesn't need that much focus so that you can mm-hmm. focus on something is incredibly helpful and important because the amount of time you have to complete something and the amount of time people want things are just it's just everything everything needs to get done at a certain and it doesn't make those things less important it's just here's the thing these are the things that i can delegate that's just part of the whole mosaic of us getting this stuff done and these are the things that i have to focus on and how to prioritize and delegate i mean that's that's essential in the cutting room you know i was pretty lucky to cut my first feature at 28 but um that was mostly out of the function is i couldn't get enough assisting work in new york i was trying really hard i was trying to get on some really big crews like tim squire's crew i was just trying so hard to get on that crew um but you know the the editors i did mentor under which was like kate sanford michael berenbaum wendy stansler jim lyons who cut all of todd haynes films was like my mentor um for the longest time, um, uh, just having that experience um, alone um, may be such a better editor. You know, uh, my first job was working on TV Nation, and there were the eight editors that worked on that show, all barking at me to get <laughs> to do certain things. And I was like, "Yes, yes, whatever you need," you know. And I didn't even know how to turn on a computer yet, let alone like, you know, know how to digitize dailies. So. Um, but I was like, I, I'm here to learn. I'm here, you know, service to these magicians, these alchemists, and I'm going to soak it all in as much as I can. If it's just me getting a coffee for the day, how can I, what way is that, would you like that coffee? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, um, anything I could do, eventually that turns into, um, hey, what song do you think I should use here? Or, um, or what's wrong with a scene? Can you tell me, you know, and, um, and that trust and, um, that mentorship is, is so valuable. I just, um, I just encourage anybody who's thinking about it to just chill and, and, and try to be patient. And, and if you don't have that opportunity yet, reach out to people like us, keep at it, you know, eventually, 
there will be a spot open for you. One of the first editor, well, the first editor I worked under was Bill Panko, who became a mentor of mine. To this day, I still ask him advice. And um, I, I clicked into the fact pretty quickly that he valued his cappuccino after lunch. And I became the, I became the cappuccino expert <laughs> instantly because I, I knew that it was, it was important to him and it helped him. Um, but, you know, he was someone who obviously was cutting on film and um, needed an assistant in the room. So um, I learned to do that pretty quickly with um, Tracy Bowers, who was his regular first assistant for a long time. I worked under her too, but I would fill in for her. But even when he transitioned to cutting digitally, I would always be in the room because he liked having sounding boards and people there to talk through what he was thinking and what he was doing. And that was just a mentorship that is, you know, I crave having assistants who are interested on that level and want to be there for that and are eager to get their other work done so they can come hang out with me and talk about the, you know, the challenges they're facing putting the scene together and I get their ideas from it. And that's, you know, that is so valuable to me as an editor. And it was valuable to me at the time as an assistant, but I got to work under people like Bill and Barry Malkin and all these other editors who, Steve Rotter, people who taught me all these things because dialogue in the cutting room was just a regular part of the process. So we can't lose that. Um, I think it's really essential. You know, the other thing I wanted to say about cutting scenes with assistants, when I give scenes to them to cut, and they throw it back at me. Often, um, the first question I'll ask them is why? Why did you cut it this way? Why did you start with this shot? Why did you go to this shot and then this shot? And then why are you cutting in the middle of that line? And they often always say, um, well, I, that, that means because I'm asking it that I'm assuming it's wrong. I'm not. I want to know what they're I want to know what their approach is, what their strategy is, and that they're thinking about cutting a scene in that way to maximize the material and think about what the point is of the scene in the overall piece and cut to emphasize that. Instead of just putting together the pieces that sort of click together and haphazardly go through, that as soon as you start to think about scene structure that way and editorial structure that way and grammar and all those other ingredients and why it was shot that way, influencing how it's being cut, that you have to think about all those things when you're putting it together to get the ultimate version of the scene to click. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Everything that you both just said, like it just, it's, it's, I think it's going to be very good to, to, to have my viewers watch and hear what you're saying, because a lot, including myself, a lot of us are like, when am I going to get my chance to edit? Why can't I become an editor before I'm 30? Why can't, uh, these are questions that we're actually asking. And it's, it's, it's not, you know, I myself, I'm, I'm, I'm at that point too, where I'm just like, I'm still an assistant. Why has it happened for me? What am I, you know? And it's- no, you, Yeah, yeah, you're already an editor. You're already an editor. You're, you're just now waiting for your credits. And there's a difference uh, between the credits and, uh, and you uh, continuing to learn. And so, and you can buy, and like I said, you can cut on the side. So um, I understand exactly, because by, by the way, that went through our heads as well at, at one point or another. So of course. Um, we're, we're just saying that you can, you can do both, you know, you can do both. Yeah. You can, no, I, you can. You that's know. absolutely, well, it's just, it's refreshing to hear. And it's, it's just, it kind of um, just helps us sort of relax and just not, you know, take it one step at a time and enjoy the people that we're learning from. And I'm, I've been in really, I'm just so lucky to be been in really great rooms and have mentors just be so gracious. I mean, right now I'm in a really awesome editing room with, you know, Scott Burns and Craig O'Brien. And it's just every, all, all of these people are just being very gracious with their, their knowledge and their time. And, Sometimes, you know, when I think about like, when am I going to be an editor, it kind of distracts from that, that process or that, that experience. So, you know, this, with your advice has sort of helped me like, just, just relax, just take it one step at a time, enjoy and soak up everything that they're, they're giving you. And at the same time, you know, learn from the job that I'm, I'm working at. Um, so thank you. Uh, thanks for also being a little bit over seven minutes. Uh, 
I appreciate all the experience and stories and advice that you've given us. And um, congratulations again on your Eddie win and um, thank you. rooting for you guys at the Oscars. So all thank right. you again um, for taking the time. And I'm sure a lot of my viewers are gonna take a lot out of this. So um, I'll have this up uh, probably mid next week. So uh, I'll send great link, but I really appreciate the time again. Thank you so much for chatting and um, sharing your experiences. Of thank course. you. Thank you. Th thank you for having us. Really appreciate right. it. Yeah. And best right. of luck with everything. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Keep, All right. keep at All it. Right. Keep at it. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Take care.